Let me ask you a question. Am I being a jerk? Here's the scenario. I'm at a friend's house for a dinner party. Nothing special, just a bunch of friends gabbing around a table, having drinks. The moment in question arises when our host brings out a tray of meatballs. Yummy. Everyone enjoys them. Well, all of us except one, the vegetarian wife of my coworker. At this point, I ask her the same question I ask most vegetarians. I asked, have you ever wondered whether plants can feel things? What if plants feel pain? Then what would you do? My attempt to follow up any questions was cut short. What is this, she replied, some kind of Lord of the Rings bullshit? Was I just a drunk dork on a Tolkien tirade? The truth is, I seriously do wonder if plants have feelings. Not like happy or sad or whatever, but what if it feels a certain way to be a plant? Just like it feels a certain way to be a human. Now before you call me a jerk, just hear me out. Because if what I'm saying is true, it means that we're all monsters. Even vegetarians. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. How is it even possible that we have feelings at all? By feelings, again, I don't mean feelings like happy or sad or love or anxiety. Those are some feelings. But more broadly, what about the feeling of seeing the color red? Or the feeling of experiencing a good movie? Have you ever listened to a song that took you back to a previous time? Could you feel what it was like to be back there? There's a feeling to your default state of being during college, or during middle school, or in your late 30s. By just being, it feels a certain way. These feelings have philosophical names, and depending on the vocabulary, they are referred to as phenomena or qualia. How is it even possible that we experience qualia? This question is commonly referred to as the hard problem of consciousness, a term coined by the philosopher and former hair metal guitarist David Chalmers. At its simplest, the question is, how can the physical world produce the mental world? One explanation is that the world is composed of two different substances, the mental and the physical. Also known as dualism, it's usually framed as mind-body dualism. However, this theory quickly runs into some problems. How do mind and body interact with one another? Does one control the other? It would seem that body controls the mind that if you do damage to your brain, you do damage to your mind. This dualism starts to look like something very different, something known as materialism. For materialists, there isn't a mental world. At least, it's not the ultimate reality. It's an illusion. What's primary is material, like matter and the body. This theory dominates modern science and academia. But if this is true, then how can matter produce qualia? How does a thing that doesn't feel produce something that does? There are those who would flip this whole equation on its head. It's not the mind that's a secondary illusion. Instead, matter plays second fiddle. This idea may sound foreign, but there were large periods in the history of philosophy where this theory was the most popular. The problems are obvious though. If everything is mental, why does it seem like matter behaves in a certain way completely independent of us? And how did the mental stuff get here without the help of matter? Those questions are why materialism dominates today. Materialists today now try to solve the hard problem by claiming that the mind emerges after a certain level of complexity is reached. A rock has no consciousness since it doesn't compute anything. A brain, however, calculates a great deal. From this calculation springs forth the feelings of qualia. If this is true, it could be possible to simulate consciousness in other organizations of computational matter. This is the goal of many computer scientists, 
and it's also the wet dream of millions of science fiction nerds. But instead of future conscious intelligence created out of silicone computers, what of our carbon brethren computing information biologically? When does this consciousness emerge? At what complexity? Is a dog complex enough? Most people think so. But what about a shrimp? A shrimp is about as dumb as you can get for an animal. But with its eyes, does it not see? Does it not have the experience of qualia associated with sight? But now, the moment you've been waiting patiently for, what about plants? Are they complex enough to be conscious? We already know that many plants talk. Tree? I am no tree. For instance, when attacked by an aphid, a bean plant will give off an odor that other plants can detect. When the other plants hear this distress signal, they release chemicals in response that attract a different kind of insect, a wasp. Guess who eats aphids and doesn't eat bean plants? That's right, the wasp. Okay, so that's pretty impressive, but all this sounds like it could be done fairly mechanically. It's a far cry from sentience. However, scientists do claim that plants have developed anywhere from 15 to 20 different senses, many of which are like ours. For example, we've known for a while that many plants will grow their roots towards water. We've just assumed that plants have some kind of spidey sense for H2O. But it's even more sophisticated than that. Plants will grow in the direction of the sound of running water, even if no water is present. Also, plants will release more pollen when they hear the sound of bees buzzing nearby. Again, this is very nice and all, but it could be pretty mechanical. Plants don't have the brain or a nervous system that creates the feelings and memories that determine our reality. But what about the mimosa? Not the mimosa from the party. But the Mimosa Pudica. The Mimosa isn't called the sensitive plant because it likes to watch romantic comedies. It got the name from its incredible awareness of its environment. When a Mimosa plant is touched, it clenches its leaves like a Venus flytrap. This tends to freak out insects who will then buzz off. If a Mimosa is jostled or even dropped, it will behave similarly. This is exactly what ecologists Monica Gagliano did. She rigged up a system of 50 potted mimosas and dropped them 15 centimeters every five seconds, about 60 times in a row. After about five or six drops, some of the mimosas began to open up their leaves. By the end, almost all had done the same. The plant had learned that the drop was not a threat. This is remarkable, but more than just learning, the mimosas even remembered the lesson. After conducting a drop, Gagliano was able to wait up to 28 days and then drop the mimosa to the same response. The plant had retained the knowledge for an entire month. It doesn't have a brain, uh, which of course suggests that, you know, this is possible, it can be done, this kind of um, behavioral expression can be done without a brain. It's easy to underestimate how big of a deal this is. But think about it. Where is the plant storing this information? How is it even processing it? We know brains are probably the most sophisticated tool in nature for storing and processing information. But is it the only one? If consciousness is a result of information processes, then could these plants have a simpler form of consciousness? They may not have a complex feeling for, say, my spouse left me for my cousin. But could they have a simpler base feeling? The feeling of what it's like to be a plant? Materialists will debate this, but most disagree. The complexity line for emergence of consciousness lies somewhere in between a goldfish and a chicken, not a sunflower and a dandelion. This emergence is a big problem though. Humans are a combination of trillions of unaware cells in the body. Human consciousness emerges out of this combination. But then could you claim that the organization of humans are conscious? 
what makes the combination of unaware cells in my body any different from the unrelated humans combined to make up a government body like France? Is the Earth conscious? Most materialists will blow this off, arguing that consciousness is likely a product of a very specific type of biological complexity. But why the bias toward the biological? And if this bias is true, then why the faith in artificial intelligence based on silicone and not the carbon of biology? These are all problems with the idea of consciousness as an emergent property. One way around these is to ditch the concept of emergence altogether. What if consciousness doesn't emerge at a certain point? What if it's always been there to begin with? This is the basic argument of monist. Like the idealist and materialist, there is only one substance, but this one substance has both properties. Mental and physical are merely two aspects of the same substance. There are many different spins on monism, some more convincing than others. The bad theories basically just turn into dualism, or sometimes materialism with the mental aspect of the substance playing a subordinate role to the physical. However, a common conclusion drawn from monism is that everything has mental properties. Each thing, from the totality of the universe to the smallest tiny little atom, feels. This is also known as panpsychism. Mind is everywhere. Even if we ditch all of this, the dualism, the mimosa pudica, the panpsychism, even if we ignore all of it. Isn't the original question a fun thought experiment anyway? What if plants did feel? Eating a salad wouldn't be so guilt-free anymore. That's for sure. No, please, no! I forgot that for me! <laughs> Though in all seriousness, what the hell would we even do about it? This is what I was trying to get at during that dinner party. In hindsight, awkward timing on my part. Is there any smooth transition from chatter on meatballs to a dialogue concerning the mental states of plants? Probably not. So maybe it was a jerk move. But if what I'm saying is true, it means I'm also something much worse than a jerk. I'm a monster living off the destruction of feeling things. It means we all are monsters. One of the primary deities in Hinduism is the god Shiva. He is known as the god of destruction. With one hand, he wields a sword of flames to destroy the world. But in the other, he bears an hourglass drum, a symbol of time and creation. With the passage of time, Shiva's destruction leads to another creation. There's something beautiful and horrifying about a cosmic logic where Everything that lives and exists can only do so on the condition of the destruction and death of other things. That all creation is a form of destruction. That all joy comes at the cost of other beings. Maybe we are all Shiva. Or maybe this is all just some Lord of the Rings bullshit. 